Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for our um, Clear Path Syndicate webinar where we're looking around at managing reputation in a crisis. For those of you who haven't met, I think I've met everyone who's sort of joining us this afternoon. My name's David Linky. I'm the Managing Director of Edubrook. Just a couple little housekeeping things. Your microphone's off and your cameras are off. At the bottom of your screen, you'll have a Q&A. And if you want to ask any questions, we openly encourage you to do so through that system. There's also a chat box as well, but try and put questions to the Q&A because then they go to the panelists. Um, we actually are lucky to have Arj um, Ganeshalingam from Port of Valley with us today. Are you there with us, Arj? Hi, yes, I am, David. Thanks for having me. Um, Arj is actually dialed on on, the, on his phone and we're going to control slides for him because of where he is right at the moment. It's, just, it's a little bit easier for him. Um, firstly, what I'd like to do is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which each of us is um, meeting from today. Obviously, um, we acknowledge their continuous and unbroken custodianship of Australia. And specifically, I pay my respects to any elders past, present or future, and specifically those who may be with us today who um, uh, are Indigenous. Um, just a very brief introduction to Edgegrowth. We're Australia's EdTech and Innovation Hub, and essentially we were founded by a number of organisations who through their foresight and their commitment to innovation um, decided that Edgegrowth should be in existence to try and grow the Australian EdTech ecosystem. So we thank Charles Sturt, Griffith University, the Trobe University, Monash, Deakin, and Navitas. And uh, really, um, we are in a really interesting space right at the moment with the way that EdTech is getting such a huge um, focus right at the moment. I'm hearing all sorts of stories about people in the marketplace who are getting literally 50 to 100 Google inquiries on an hourly basis and they're working out how to support those companies. And it's, it's exciting to be able to have Arj from Port of Valley here to sort of help guide us with a framework of going about building an EdTech, um, to build, sorry, building your and managing your reputation during this crisis. So um, I've got some slides, sorry, Arj has got some slides which I'm going to share for him. I'll hand over to you, Arj. No worries at all. And, and thanks, David, and, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and uh, look, first and foremost, I hope everyone's doing well and continuing on as, as best as possible in, in the circumstances. Um, what I thought I would do for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is, is talk briefly about some of our observations as to how organisations, both in Australia and abroad, are protecting and even enhancing their reputation through this current COVID-19 situation. Uh, and what I've done is distill some of our experiences and insights into uh, five really, really simple key themes, uh, which I believe will be really important for businesses to consider in the coming weeks and months when it comes to balancing both short-term opportunities uh, alongside what it means to, to build a long-term reputation uh, in, in one's industry or, or sector. Um, so if we, we go over this slide uh, to the next uh, to the next slide, just before we continue, just a very brief introduction to Port and Valley for, for those who, who might not know too much about us. Uh, we're a communications firm that has been in Australia for, for nearly 50 years, uh, and we're part of uh, the Clemenger Group, which some of you may know of. Uh, the Clemenger Group's the, one of the region's largest holding groups of marketing services companies. And we're also part of a, an international network of 90 offices in around 60 countries. Uh, Port Novelli is a team of 25 communications consultants along the eastern seaboard. And, and while we originally started out in, in the business of public relations, we've, we've really evolved the way we practice communications over the last decade uh, in line with really the changing media and communications landscape that, that now exists. Um, and if we go over the slide, just to give a very quick snapshot about some of the work that we do. Um, today, we think very much beyond the media results of the organisations we work with. Uh, we have a very strong commitment to, to strategy first and to working within data and insights to inform communication outcomes. Uh, we help create uh, powerful voices and thought leadership opportunities for our organisations and clients in a range of industries. We produce uh, a significant volume of creative and digital content to suit all channels. And, and most importantly, and I think for today, is advising companies and uh, their leadership to find ways to protect and enhance their reputation, particularly during issues and crises. 
uh, we're currently advising a number of organisations, uh, including within the education sector, as they navigate the, the challenges and complexity associated with COVID-19. Um, we're also working with Austrade's international education arm uh, as we speak to communicate to the sector and to international students about the latest news and information which is having an impact on their study experience in Australia. Um, if we, we head over the, the next slide now, and I think a good starting point uh, for us is to, to have a, a really clear and simple understanding about how we view reputation. Because it is very common for, for people to confuse the concept uh, of brand on one side and reputation. For us, brand is, is very much a, a customer-centric concept um, based on relevancy and, and how you, you differentiate your brand uh, in the market and the promise you make to your consumers or customers. Reputation, on the other hand, is really what's built around the idea of legitimacy uh, and quite simply whether or not you keep the promise that you make as a brand. Um, it often is said that, that the reputation of an organisation is, is what people may say about you when you leave the room. And it's a really interesting way of thinking about what reputation is versus having a great brand. Um, because for us, reputation, it is quite simply everything. It's the way that we make our, our decision to purchase, whether it be as a, a customer um, or as, as an organisation. It's the way that we decide uh, who we choose to partner with or, um, or collaborate alongside. Uh, even as an employee of an organisation, it's, it's the reputation of your prospective employer that you use to evaluate a job prospect. Um, and it's really the, the total sum of, of an organization's track record. And that's why it is, it is painstaking to build. It's not something that's done overnight. It is challenging to protect and, and enhance. And as we've all probably seen and, and uh, have all uh, observed in, in many different ways, it can implode in a moment. And I think that's why reputation is such an important part of thinking about an organization and and your long-term objectives in, in coming through a crisis such as COVID-19. I will go over this slide and I want to call out um, a gentleman by the name of, of Mark Rickson. Can I just ask you um, something before you go on, yeah. Arch? Go Can on, I Dave. just ask you, whilst we're here and we're talking about reputation, do you distinguish between brand reputation and a company's reputation? Are they one and the same? I think it's very easy to say that they are one and the same, but I think they do stand apart. Certainly. Um, I think when you think about a brand, um, and like I said, it is certainly that the brand can, can be constructed of, of the visual elements, it can be constructed of what you stand for out in the market. Um, there is sometimes a, an outward view. It's, it's basically um, a brand is considered, you know, how you want to position yourself out to your market or out to your consumers or customers. Reputation is almost the other way. It's actually how everyone around you looks into your organisation. Um, and that can sometimes be framed by people that may have not ever actually interacted with your brand. Uh, it could be someone that's heard about you or read about you or talked to a friend or a colleague and told something about your reputation. So it's very, um, I think it's a very kind of separate way of looking at it. They do intersect. They certainly uh, have an impact on one another, but I think brand and reputation do certainly stand apart in, in our opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, look, some of you, you might, might have heard of a gentleman by the name of Mark Ritson. He's a, a brand consultant and a former professor at Melbourne Business School, and he's regularly quoted in, in media, including uh, The Australian, I think every, every couple of weeks. Um, Mark wrote a, a piece only a few days ago in Marketing Week, which is a, a well-regarded online publication, and he called out the, the many brands and organisations uh, in the last month or so which have, which have felt compelled to take action during COVID-19. Um, but many of those organisations have, have really only done so by sending that, uh, that empathetic email to their customer database, which I'm sure all of us uh, on this webinar are probably inundated with our inbox right now with emails around COVID. Um, or there's been organisations and brands that have creatively changed their, their logo, for example, to show their support through COVID-19. Uh, McDonald's in Brazil, for example, recently changed their logo across all of their social media platforms by separating the two golden arches to reinforce the idea of social distancing. And Mark was saying that, you know, while it's very interesting to see brands uh, take action or show their support during COVID-19, 
a lot of the brands that perhaps are missing the mark are those that are focused on communicating first and then action second. Um, and by having that way of, of looking at their way of, uh, of going about their communications response, often it, it's a very superficial reaction um, because many organisations aren't capable of a tangible or maybe even a strategic response to COVID-19. Um, I think that's very different for for the education sector and ed tech. I think you're in a really interesting space here and a, a really interesting opportunity during these unprecedented times. Um, and there's no better way than of saying it than what Mark even said in his article, which is um, for, for companies like EdTech, the, the best thing that you might be able to do is not actually talk about COVID-19. Um, the best thing you might be able to do is just get on with business, um, get on with making a tangible and impactful change to the sector and to education providers and to creating a, a really fantastic teaching and learning environment uh, here in Australia. Um, we'll go to the next slide just to, to finish off what, what Mark said, but I think what he was he was alluding to was that there are a number of organisations and, and industries where um, you don't have to be feeling the nation's pain necessarily. Um, the most important organisations are those that are here to keep the wheels of business turning. Um, and I think that's a, a really interesting thing to, to take away from, from something that Mark said, um, to develop new products and services that reflect today's challenges. Um, to, to price them in a manner that maximises availability and profitability. And Mark is a very controversial person. He, he likes to be a little bit contentious. And uh, the line at the bottom there that you can see is, is make money, not moral statements, and, and get on with it. Um, but that, I think, is a, there is something in there to think about um, for companies in their tech and, and other industries that have an opportunity to redefine their way of working or redefine their sector um, through a very challenging time for, for all Australians and, and people around the world. Um, so if we just go over to the, the slide, the next slide is, is some of these sectors um, that are being asked to stand up in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, those such as the supermarket chains or even food delivery providers, they're being given a once in a lifetime opportunity, I, I really think, to enhance or even redefine their reputation in the eyes of the consumer. Um, let's see what people say about the likes of an Uber in three or six or nine months time uh, as they navigate through this period of uncertainty um, to provide support to uh, local businesses and to restaurateurs who they've traditionally had a, a very um, fraught relationship with. Um, Woolies as well and, and Coles and, and the other supermarkets um, certainly are, are doing everything they can to, to support the local community. And it's certainly shifting the way people are thinking about, about the retailers uh, in this current environment. Um, for sectors such as EdTech, uh, COVID-19 is going to put that promise of digital transformation to the test. Uh, as, as, as you all would know, that institutions are accelerating their transformation to remote teaching and learning. Um, and I think it's fair to say, and I think we, you know, we might all, all be fair to say that, that nothing will maybe ever take away the, the rich experiences of human interaction. Um, but there is certainly a global expectation in today's climate that technology is on our side to, to keep and to help keep businesses moving. So I think you're in a very well-positioned uh, part of your industry to really manage, build, and, and enhance your reputation through this crisis. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, and I think this is just going to be the starting point for, for five uh, things that I'd, I'd like to leave you all with today. Um, there's no doubt that, that a crisis can cause many problems, but it also creates those opportunities. Um, and as we continue through this unprecedented time, I think this will become an expectation uh, really, rather than a need. I think at the moment, it's, it's certainly something that's desired and, and um, asked for by providers. But I think more and more, as we become familiar with this new normal, um, the onus will be on businesses uh, in technology, for example, to, to really help drive that change at a faster rate. Um, and in EdTech, you know, that is a significant undertaking, I imagine, for a number of, of companies like yourselves. Uh, it's going to be one that's filled with risk and there's going to be things that go right that there'll be things that go wrong, um, but you have a genuine opportunity to, to reshape the model of education and, and transform it for the better. And, and yes, there are commercial benefits and opportunities that, that can come with that. That doesn't necessarily mean though that you need to be the ambulance chaser. Um, and I think this is the perfect time to see yourself as the firefighter in, in, in an emergency response if you want to look at it that way. Um, a firefighter in the way that you're willing to work together with others. 
to solve challenges, to create a learning environment for students and deliver that positive change as we rescue uh, the industry, if you, want to, if you want to look at it that way, um, but deliver that positive change for years to come. Um, now, it's a very fine balance to, between having that reputation as being the ambulance chaser um, or being the firefighter. Um, so what I'd like to take you through are, are five insights to position you as the firefighter in, in the midst of a crisis. Um, so let's just move straight into the first one there, David. And the first one is the concept of purpose. Um, on the next slide is, um, is something that we led in 2019, which was Australia's first purpose premium index, which asked around 5,000 Australians for their thoughts and attitudes towards Australian and global companies that were motivated by purpose. Now, I think when it comes to managing reputation, purpose and, and the values that you hold as an organisation are a critical element of decision making. In our research, we found, uh, what we found was that Australians expect greater transparency across the value chain and expect business to contribute to society and demonstrate their strong value. Uh, I think years of political change in Australia has certainly reduced trust in, in politicians and government to the extent that, that consumers are increasingly looking to companies to solve those societal issues that can, um, that can also be in times of crisis. When we looked at reputation, we found three dimensions. And you can see those at the bottom there is uh, reliability, success, and uh, responsibility. And within responsibility, purpose-led communication had a really strong role to play in what, is, uh, what helps an organisation be positioned as a responsible company. We also found that Australians were almost 40% more likely to purchase a product or service from a company seen to be responsible and seen to be operating with purpose. So a really interesting uh, takeaway here is, is the importance of purpose and purpose matters even at the best of times, but also at the worst of times. So if we go over the slide, there are just three things to, to think about when it comes to purpose as we navigate uncertainty. Just one sec, Arch, can, you, can I just go yeah. back for a second? Yeah. This data that we're looking at here is Australian data, right? So you're saying yes. in Australia, Reliability is 41% of the purchasing decision, 30% success, and then 29% responsibility. Is that right? Is that understanding that yeah, correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so the dimensions of reputation. So if you ask, a, a, we ask uh, 5,000 Australians how you view reputation, what are the things that matter to you about a brand and an organisation, uh, and then these are the attributes that they, uh, they place against them, and then we cluster them into three core themes. And do you have any sense of how that translates to international markets? Like, do you have a sense that Australians care more about, for example, responsibility that then maybe North Americans or Europeans? Do you have any of that sense or not? Yeah, so the, the research was actually done in America um, about, I would say about nearly 12 months before we undertook it. So it was in about 2018 um, that our Port Novelli counterparts in, in the US uh, did the same purpose premium index. Uh, what they found actually was purpose was uh, actually a, a far more important uh, dimension for Americans than it was for Australians, um, which is a really interesting attribute. And, and I think what we came back to was um, reliability was, was the more important facet for us here in Australia. In America, it was roughly one third each. Um, whereas as you can see here, reliability really kind of shot ahead for, for Australians. Um, and it really is just the the very Australian pragmatic view of um, we just want things that work and we just want to know that what we're buying is a, is a trustworthy quality product. Um, and that changes between different sectors, but by and large, that is what was most important for Australians in, in the current market. The, the reason I bring it up is I just, I'm, I'm, I know some people here on this call who have operations uh, in different parts of the world. And I guess that was just the point I wanted to make is that ultimately, the messaging may move slightly depending upon geographic uh, location or region that you're selling to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do have some other um, markets around the world that are, that are undertaking similar research um, and they would have already done it. So if, um, if we do find anything, I'll definitely share that with you, David, to pass on to the others. And there is another question that we've had from someone in the audience, which is around, do you have any data around international students specifically as a cohort and whether, whether this model is similar for them? Unfortunately, we, we didn't look at um, international students as a cohort. We did look at um, attributes around age, uh, gender, uh, states uh, in different locations, but unfortunately not specific to international students. 
Um, but that's a, that's a really good thing. Uh, given the, the more and more work we're doing in this space, I, I don't think that would be a, a bad thing to maybe explore in, in the next uh, iteration of this research. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the, the three things I guess to, to take away as we, as we navigate uncertainty is that this is certainly a time when performance will be judged by how a company and its leadership serves everyone uh, and fulfills a higher purpose. Simply how a company is showing up and meeting the requirements and expectations of, of its many stakeholders. Um, the problem and the challenge that comes with communicating your purpose though is that you have to get it right because Otherwise, you will be accused of piggybacking or virtue signaling or a kind of purpose washing to try and promote your own brand. Um, and this, I, I really believe this will be a fine line that companies will have to, to really explore cautiously in the coming weeks as no one wants to be seen to be opportunistic or, or exploitive. Um, but three ways to act with purpose in, in the right way. The, the first is uh, this is a really important opportunity to refer back to your mission, your vision and your values as an organisation. Um, and I think grounding every business decision you make within those, uh, within those attributes will really help you frame your purpose and uh, help inform your business decisions as you navigate a crisis like COVID-19. I think also... ...human element that, I, that I'll cover in a, in a moment, but the idea of, of empathy in your actions, but also um, standing up and saying, we're, we're going to do what we say we're going to do. Uh, and that brings me to my third point, is that authenticity will win, both now and in the long term. Um, and having a strong purpose allows you to be authentic uh, and true to yourself as a brand and as an organisation. The second theme to discuss, um, if we just jump to a couple of slides, is, is the idea of people and, and putting people first. Um, and, Sorry to, to have to put this photo up of, of Mr. Trump, but um, when you hear him say uh, economics first um, and people second, or people kind of interpret his, his views as that, I think it's a very timely reminder that this is very much a human problem and a human crisis. And I think at a time when we're faced with more questions than answers, uh, our professional relationships, the way that we're interacting with each other as people uh, is really critical when it comes to considering your organisation's reputation as well. A lot of the, the brands and organisations that we're seeing communicate well and manage their reputation well through COVID uh, and even other crises in the past that we've, that we've worked with in. Um, bushfires, for example, um, is around reducing fear and anxiety. Every decision, every business decision and every communication outcome from that decision has been to reduce fear and anxiety around lives and livelihoods. And I think, again, when you're in the midst of a crisis, you can forget uh, that people come first, that those people start within your organisation and then more widely beyond there. But I do encourage you to, to think about that. And I think the supermarkets right now are doing a, a really good thing. Um, and they're a great example of how every action they're taking, whether it's product restrictions, whether it's opening hours, whether it's health and safety within their retail setting, um, it's all laddering back to, to what their purpose is right now, which is to be a helpful member of the community. And um, I think that's a, a good lesson to take away when you're thinking about your own sector and your own environment uh, in, in working with education providers. Because I think what it allows you to do is create that, that sense of trust and shared responsibility uh, for your constituents. And very often, uh, it's those organisations that are shown to care about their people and care about their communities are the ones that leave a lasting impact and their brand and reputation holds very true in the long term. It helps them stand out as that true corporate citizen. Um, so I know it might seem a little bit obvious, but it can be lost often in the, in the midst of a crisis is the, the, the human element that really has to come front and centre. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the third one and the idea about relevance. Um, we've probably all heard the phrase around the new normal, uh, which has reappeared in, in the last few weeks, but again, it's also important to think about the world that we are now entering into and the, and the world we're going to move into uh, in the coming months and, and obviously into the, the coming years. Um, this is a very different world for, for not just our customers and our end users, but our partners and, and others, um, both in the education sector and, and in every sector. In, uh, I think there's no sector that's going to be immune to COVID-19 for, for good or for bad. So I think it's important that we need to remain relevant 
through this period of transition and change. And remaining relevant means that it's not simply about uh, selling ideas or work that is no longer relevant today or a priority in, in, in the midst of today's crisis. Um, nothing turns a partner or a customer off faster than, than trying to sell what is now not relevant to them. And I think managing reputation in a really proactive way is actually evolving or adapting your work and your business to suit the needs of that time as you, as you work through the different stages of a crisis. Um, an important shift in that mindset is also to focus on finding things we can solve and the opportunities we can leverage, not just simply looking for that revenue. Um, and the work might not always be the things that we would usually do or the services we would usually provide for a client. No better example than, um, than LVMH uh, at the moment. Who, um, and LVMH in, in France is, is making and donating hand sanitizer to help French hospitals in their fight against COVID-19. Um, now, LVMH didn't overtly or aggressively go out and, and say, uh, and sing from the rooftops and say, hey, look at us and look what we're doing. Um, it was uh, a change in their business operations that uh, eventually, through through different ways, had, had, had reached the public domain. Um, but you might wonder why on earth is LVMH doing this? Uh, LVMH has got three shared values across every one of their brands that they, that they hold. The three values are to be creative and innovative, to deliver excellence, and to cultivate an entrepreneurial spirit. And I think that's a very great example of a brand that's, that's looked at what they stand for and said, this actually stands true to what we want to be as a brand. More than any of their products or any of their bags or perfumes or whatever they might produce in the future, um, this is an opportunity for them to shape their reputation in the long term and they've taken that opportunity. So I think it's a, just a great example and I'm sure there are many different examples you're seeing both here in Australia and abroad about companies that are just doing what needs to be done um, and creating opportunities by solving different problems uh, that might be outside of their, their traditional box. The, uh, the final two points that we'll move into, just they really go hand in hand. The first is around focus. Um, in the midst of a crisis, the, the rapid and the, the immediacy and the speed of a crisis means that it is very easy to lose focus or be distracted um, by the most critical issues that are sitting in front of you. And it can be sometimes to the detriment of your reputation in the long term. So from a communication standpoint and, and when it comes to managing reputation, there are three phases or three questions that I, that I often talk to organisations about to help them shape uh, their mindset and even their tone and their focus at different points in time. The, the most immediate and the most obvious is, is how do I add value today uh, to the organisation or to who we are working with in the midst of a, of a current crisis? Um, how do we eliminate all those distractions and push towards a, a common goal in a way that makes failure not an option right now? The second is what are those ideas um, that we have uh, in, in store that we can help deliver to add new and powerful value to the industry um, or to organisations as we work through that recovery phase? Um, what have we maybe been thinking about that we haven't been able to do before? Or what are those ideas that we've had to put on pause right now that may be appropriate uh, in, in, in the short term future? And the third phase is what is the new reality likely to look like? Uh, and how do we then help organisations prepare for a new and evolving business environment uh, as we build and, and work very much through that recovery phase into what we continue to say is, is the new normal or the, or the new world in, in front of us. Um, and that probably just takes me to my, to my last point, uh, is around um, the horizon and, and the idea of bouncing back. Uh, it's, it's important to remember um, every crisis is, is temporary by nature. And it's good organisations out there that are thinking both about right now but also what comes next and how to prepare themselves for when we return to that uh, to that better way of working to a, a new way of working and prepare ourselves for improved success um, i've worked with organizations that have had um, what you call the now team and the next team so the now team is focused on uh, today and tomorrow um, making sure you, you navigate through the crisis and then the next team is maybe a group of leaders who are not consumed in the day-to-day -day, uh, requirements and thinking about what that horizon looks like. 9-11 is a really interesting um, reference point that I've seen uh, and observed uh, over the last couple of weeks. 
to think about in the, in the idea of, of COVID-19 as well. Many of the world's leading global airlines at the time had teams thinking about what pilots would say to passengers on that first airplane when they, when they took back to the air. Um, they were thinking about how to manage their business and protect their employees and customers through what they knew would be many months of difficult economic pressures. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about is, is you need to definitely keep a, a very close eye on, on that horizon um, because you don't want to be caught behind. And from a reputational standpoint, you want to be seen to be thinking about those things for your, for your partners and clients and customers as well. Um, because ultimately what you're going to be left with, uh, with after a crisis has, has finished is your reputation. That is what you're left with. Um, even if you were failed or, or missed the mark during that time, will your customers forgive you? Um, and that comes down to the reputation you built, not just because of COVID-19, it's the reputation you built and fostered from day one, um, but also your reputation that you've shaped and adapted through a crisis and then out onto the other side. Uh, and employees and customers will certainly remember how a company acted in a crisis um, and thought about how those companies have faced larger challenges um, and, and certainly thought about how they can solve those challenges that are, that are put in front of all of us at the moment. And I think that's a really the last question that I've, that I've uh, put there is, how do you want to be remembered and valued in 12 months' time, uh, not just tomorrow? And I think that is a really just, just good question just to, I guess, again, keep in the back of your minds as you're thinking about every business decision you're taking at the moment um, is there is an end point for this crisis. Uh, and when you come out of that crisis, how do you want your reputation to stand up uh, in the market as well? Um, so look, that, that's probably all from me at the moment, Dave, before we go to questions. And I can't help but come back to, to Mr. Ritson. Um, the best thing we probably can do right now is, is simply to get on with it. So uh, I'll pass it back to David and uh, yeah, happy to, to talk a bit more. Fantastic. I've got some questions to start, but I just remind everyone that you can put questions in the Q&A box and we can um, ask them live. And we'll have... Um, actually, I've just killed my... Q&A box, let me get it back here. And also, um, I'm assuming we'll be able to share your slides, Art, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions, I've got a couple of here, but I've just got a, a couple I wanted to put in first, just to, to think about, I, I wanted to ask you a specific question, which I'm getting lots of at the moment, and that is, my competitors in the market are offering free trials, as an example. And we don't know that we want to, but the customer's sort of giving us, putting some pressure on us to do that. What, what are your thoughts about how do you balance that pressure from the customer in light of this crisis to be able to still stand the ground to say, you know what we're doing, we are firefighting and we don't do that for free. Do you want to sort of comment on that at all, if you can? Yes. Yeah, look, it's an interesting one. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I'm going to give the perfect answer, but I'll, I'll definitely talk through what my there thought process is. Yeah. That's what we know. Right? It's an evolving no, time. That's what we can say, Arjun. It was evolving. We're not, we're not sure. <laughs> um, I think the first thing to be to think about in, in situations like that is, is transparency. Um, and I think the, the organisations that are willing to be true to themselves and transparent when they're faced with that question, um, to have that very honest conversation with, with partners around uh, your investment that you're making in the long term. I think from what I've seen, and, and I'll talk very plainly from even observations being in a consultancy, is um, we've had a lot of organisations respect us for saying that we're here for the long term. And that doesn't mean giving away thousands and thousands of dollars of free consulting advice um, just to keep you. Uh, we've invested in the relationship in the long run and, and we're here to be, to be through that journey with you. I think it's an inevitable struggle that you're going to face, um, but I believe that solely being measured by price is not where you want to be in, as an industry as a whole. Um, and I think certainly being, a, being in a competitive environment where you're having to give away services for free to get your foot in the door um, I don't necessarily think that's the right way to do it. And, I, and like I said, David, I appreciate that there, there are co companies doing that. Um, but I think any company that holds true to themselves and, and holds firm on valuing their services and their relationships uh, appropriately through this time, and again, I'll come back to what Mark said, um, 
is you've got to maximise availability and profitability. Um, that's what's going to be uh, the the mark of success of, of edtech uh, as you come through this. So I would sorry if I haven't answered that completely, no, but no, that's certainly no, the, the viewpoint that, that I have. No, I'm comfortable with that. I think the other point that in in our prep call that we did um, late last week or early this week, it must have been last week. Um, the thing that we did talk about really clearly is. If you want to position as a firefighter, remember firefighters charge, right? You, if you, yeah, if you, if right. you ask firefighters to come to your house when it's on fire, you pay. You don't pay directly in cash. Most people don't because they have an insurance company. But if you, uh, if you, if they turn up to your house and put the fire out, you're gonna, your insurance company is gonna pay ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars, to depending upon how many turn up. So it's an, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting um, uh, point around the fact that. Positioning as a firefighter doesn't mean it's free. Ambulances are not free. Um, so you, you, there's no reason why you have to follow the herd and match the market as well. And I think that leads really nicely into this idea of um, re, re, reminding yourself what your vision, your values and your goals are. And if the decision you make is aligned to those, and aligned to those is that you want to help people in a short period of time during the moment of crisis. You have to balance that with the real cost. And, and I, I certainly have had this conversation many times over the last few weeks with EdTech leaders. At the moment, most EdTech businesses are getting a lot of interest. But remembering the cost of delivery is still the same, if not more. You've got increased bandwidth, so your hosting costs are going up. You've got declining US dollars, which means sorry, Australian dollar against the US dollar, which means your costs are going up. So it's not unreasonable to ask the customer to pay. So I just put that out there. I've got a couple of really questions I was, in I was here. Gonna, I was just gonna say, oh, sorry, I was gonna say yeah. on that, David, as well, is, um, is if you are a company that um, decides to go down that path uh, and you make your business about COVID-19, you will be the company known for COVID-19. I think it's very hard to come out of that to go from being the, the provider that gave free solutions away through a period of crisis and then expect that when you come out of that, um, you will be able to stand up and, and value your, your service and offerings in the same way that you did three months ago. Um, so I think it's, it's fraught with, with danger when you're gonna take that path, but um, it needs to be carefully navigated with the view to what your long-term reputation will be when you come out of it, if that's the, the decision you, you take. Uh, there's a couple of questions that have come in, so I'll ask some of them. One of them is a really interesting question around, um, I'll paraphrase it because it's quite long, but in simple terms, we've been focusing on the B2B market, so we've been thinking about selling to schools. But now that schools may not be operating and it's a difficult sale, we're seeing that parents are wanting to get support as well. If we focus on the B2C market by supporting parents, will that have a long-term implications for our business from a reputation perspective, when we flip back to B, B2B. So what I'm gonna do is, I'll ask you to talk about the reputational thing. I'll talk a little bit about the B2B versus B2C um, flip in a minute, but I'll let you begin. Are you there, Arj? Hello? Sorry, yep, I am. Sorry, just putting myself on mute and taking myself on mute. Um, no, look, that's a, that's a really interesting, interesting, uh, thing to think about. I mean, like we, like we touched on before, um, if there are problems to be solved through this very unprecedented period of time, um, and it's a, an opportunity for you as a provider to shape or reshape your offering, um, and it might only be for a temporary period of time, but it doesn't go against um, your operational uh, framework, it doesn't go against your ability to continue servicing your your schools and, and partners. Um, my, my my simple answer is well, how do we how do you make that happen? I, I wouldn't put a, a closer door on that. From a reputational standpoint, um, let's not forget that that our consumers are often also our referrers, decision makers, um, and those that can help build our reputation in the long run as well. So. I think it's saying that that can be definitely explored. Like I said, I, I look at this from a very outsider's view. David, you probably have a better view within the within the sector itself. Yeah, I, I think that I, I think that the reality is that if you are selling the K to twelve schools, my, I, I'm yet to see 
the really large scale successful edtech company anywhere that's been able to commercialize a B2B and a B2C play at the same time. If you're flipping from one to the other, it's confusing depending upon the capacity of your team to be able to do that. So I think it's really an individual decision for the business to make. I wonder though, whether or not there's a disconnect between what you do during a crisis situation like this and what happens when normal business activity returns. And I think that teachers do like to see that they've got some exclusivity on the tools they use in classrooms, but that's a personal biased view. So um, I'm gonna jump through to a couple of other questions, got a few others in here. There is a really interesting question here, and I'm not gonna name the company because I, I think that it's unnecessary to do it in this forum, but I appreciate the question, Alistair. But what do you think, Arj, from a reputation perspective from an organization that is essentially scaling their business so quickly like some of the video conferencing companies around, but then the quality of the service is decreasing, which may lead to frustration with past customers, but, but you're picking up new customers at the same time. I'm wondering whether or not you've got some thoughts around that old customer versus new customer and the challenge of dealing with those in times like this, especially if you're offering free services, by the way, as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, look, Companies, I mean, yeah, companies specifically in, in the video conferencing space have, um, have absolutely taken this as an opportunity to, to reach audiences and, and users that they've never been able to before um, in, a, in a domestic or a, um, a non-professional setting. Um, if it's at the detriment of their core customer base, um, that is a, a serious risk in my opinion. Um, because again, let's remember that um, being able to achieve scale in a short period of time through a crisis, um, we have to ask the question is, as we enter into a new normal, what does that new normal look like? How many of those people who are maybe using video conferencing facilities for non-professional reasons will continue to do so uh, when we can all go and hang out with more than two people at any one time? <laughs> and when we shrink, our, shrink our, our, ourselves back into, uh, Yes, a new normal. Maybe businesses will change the way that they work because of their personal experience with new, uh, new kind of uh, tools and, and services like that. Um, it comes back to then your core customers. And if you're not supporting your core customers through this period of crisis and seem to be uh, taking an opportunistic approach, uh, that is a, a long-term impact on reputation. So I would, I would say that's something that certainly companies need to look at, especially those that have uh, kind of trying to uh, find ways to, to maximise their scale uh, through these, these next few months. And I think they're very similar things to, to non-crisis times too. As soon as you start providing offers in the market that existing customers see, there's always that yin and yang pressure of whether existing customers should have the same um, access and all those sorts of things. So I'm not sure that the crisis adds a new dimension to it. It's just maybe a bit more scale or something. I don't know. Um, there's an interesting question here, which is um, a really interesting question. So the question basically is, at a time like this, in which all sorts of challenges are being thrown up, including existential, existential questions around whether or not businesses will exist or not, you know, how do you balance short-term survival versus long-term brand? Um, or reputation, if you like, if you might, for example, flip to this B2B or B2C model and to get through the next period of time and then what impact that may have on your reputation afterwards. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that, Al? Um, I mean, the, the, the very plain uh, and I guess the harsh reality of the, the situation we're in at the moment is um, is to have a, a brand in the long term to, to protect and enhance one's reputation, there needs to be some very critical short-term decisions that every business needs to make. Um, whether that, uh, and I guess the, the key consideration for, for us at the moment when we're working with companies going through similar situations is um, if you are having to make very difficult decisions uh, in your business um, to protect income or protect revenue, um, how are you doing that in the most appropriate uh, and uh, reasonable way that still protects your reputation in, in the market, uh, even within your own workforce as, as uh, your employees, um, because this is a very turbulent and, and challenging period for, for every company. So I think 
the balance is, is quite, um, my opinion, is, the balance is, is quite obvious is that you need to sometimes uh, have that short-term view around the actions that you need to take right now to protect your business in the long run. Uh, but it shouldn't be at the detriment of a long-term reputational um, uh, impact that you might be able to deliver uh, for your brand. Yeah, I think it goes back to the point you were making before, um, which is a, around acting with dignity and honour and what you look like in 12 months' time or 24 months' time as well. You want to look back on that period and understand what you did and you didn't do. Yeah, I'll, right. I'll share very quickly an anecdotal story for people on the call without naming names. There's a, a, an, an entity that I know fairly well. They were asked by a university to support them moving a whole bunch of courses online. And the answer was, we can, but we won't. So we can do it, but we won't because our reputation and your reputation will be damaged because it won't be a great service. It won't be a great experience for the learner. So we counsel you against doing it, but if you want to do it, it's not us who can do it. And it's sort of interesting. It's sort of, they sort of de declined the short-term revenue knowing in their view, in a year's time, this, this entity will come back to them and they'll get that revenue, they'll just get it back at a later stage and I'll get it in a model that fits their reputational framework. So it's sort of, you know, hard decisions to make, but it's important. Um, question here for you, Arj. There's lots of news stories going around at the moment and lots of their tech companies are helping um, their, their, their learners a lot. And the question is, how do we attract media attention to that and should we? Um, absolutely. I, look, I think that media at the moment, there's, there's two schools of thought. So I'll, I'll give you the, um, the one side of a, a, an experience even just today with, with one of our clients. We, um, had an opportunity to talk about something to, to media that was completely unrelated um, or not impacted by COVID. Um, and the journalist on the other line of the, on the other end of the, the line today said, thank God you're calling me about something not to do with coronavirus uh, because I'm sick to death of hearing about that. And I've finally got something new that I can, that I can publish and write about. So that's kind of one school of thought. So I'll just pass that to the side. Um, at the moment though, by and large, uh, it's, it's no surprise that um, this is what is attracting eyeballs um, and it's what is getting clicks online at the moment. And journalists today are driven by uh, what is gonna drive people to their websites. It's driving people to, to pick up the paper um, and to consume media. And so absolutely, I think if you have a story to tell around how you are solving a problem through this crisis i think it's certainly a great opportunity to tell that story what i would say um, though is that media and journalists are always looking for what we call tension and conflict um, they're looking for a black hat and they're looking for a white hat that's every story is constructed with those two in mind you don't necessarily see many stories in today's day and age um, with a shrinking media landscape that is that completely over, overly positive, proactive puff piece about a brand. Um, every journalist is looking for that sense of tension. So I think if you are going to be trying to find opportunities to get your story out there in media, think very carefully about the role that you want to play in that story. You want to be the knight in, in shining armour. You want to be delivering that positive outcome. Um, the, the black hat isn't just simply COVID. Don't just assume that it's just a crisis that you're there to solve. What is the true problem you're solving? Uh, the true problem that you're solving around remote learning or teaching? Um, are there particular data points or research or statistics that you can show the problem that you're there to solve? And I think if you can then create and construct that story for today's journalists, you'll go uh, much further in being able to actually claim that space in, uh, in today's outlets because um, you aren't alone. There are many organisations and, and companies that are trying to get their moment right now to talk about what they're doing. Uh, so you need to think very carefully about how you construct that story when, when pitching to media in particular. Um, it's a really good point, actually, and, and um, people will be aware that we've been doing a lot of work at Edge Growth with media across almost all the daily newspapers, a couple of radio programs as well over the last few weeks. And at right now, we're actually asking all these techs to tell us a real story. Don't, don't give us a puff piece about, hey, we can help millions of students. I want to know about the three students at Box Hill Primary School that you're helping 
right now because if you give us that real tangible story, we will feed that into the media that work that we're doing. We're lobbying government agencies around this as well because they are in desperate need of good news stories. And, and the point that you make as well are this vitally, vitally imp important around the tension um, that reporters are looking for. So in every, t every time that, um, in the last few weeks that I've been interviewed by a, a journalist, they're asking questions about, oh, we're hearing that that's happening. How is this, how are you supporting that? And, 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 and at times they're trying to lead us down the path of saying that, you know, providers are being ill-prepared, when in fact, the reality is that all of them are on some sort of transformation. And it's really important to make sure that you understand which side of the story you're going to be on. Um, let me have a quick look here. We've got a few minutes, so I've got another question. Um, so the question here is around different channels for media, right? So obviously there's email for, uh, for marketing things, there's social media, and there's obviously traditional media. Um, what do you think around which is the right channel today at the moment, um, Arj, for, for these media stories and these good news stories? Yeah, um, I think in, in um, today's environment as well, it's probably, or it's always, even in, irrespective of, of COVID, to put your eye firmly on your audience um, and, and work backwards from there. Um, now, as a B2B provider um, with a very specific objective, uh, that you may have at the moment, um, you're working in, in very competitive spaces in traditional or earned media, as we would call it. Um, so how does that potentially allow you to pivot your strategy to maybe be more focused on your owned platforms and owned channels to activate them uh, more aggressively than you may have before? Um, if we are all remote working, if we are all significantly more online than we perhaps were two or three weeks ago, um, yes, are your social and digital channels the right place to be? Uh, so I certainly think that it's everyone's thinking very differently um, about their channel strategy at the moment. I think owned platforms are certainly uh, coming through at the moment in terms of their success. Um, and another interesting uh, probably part to that that often gets lost is um, using your individual platforms, not just your brand platforms as well. We do a lot of work with with business leaders to uh, ensure that their personal presence or profile on, on obviously obvious platforms like LinkedIn um, are being used the right way uh, and are being used as, as mouthpieces for an organisation while allowing that constant churn of content to also be coming through from a brand Facebook page or their own LinkedIn page as well. Um, the question about email, uh, just what I touched on before, if you're, if you're going to be using email uh, right now, um, make sure that it's got nothing to do with COVID. Uh, I think pretty much most users right now are, are reading the first two lines and if they see something about thoughts and wishes being with you right now um, and our safety and your safety and wellbeing is our utmost priority, I think people are pretty much hitting delete. Um, so if you're gonna use email, I, I certainly would advise that you have the right message and the right, um, even right down to the right subject line to make sure that you're cutting through that, that uh, influx of, of emails that are going through people's inboxes at the moment. I agree with that. I'll, there's one final question we'll take in a second, but just on that, one of the Intergrowth team the other day was um, making the comment that it's fantastic all these people are sending these COVID updates because it reminds me I've got these dormant account and services I haven't used for years that I need to go and close. So it's it actually has been interesting every morning to wake up to a whole bunch <laughs> of stuff saying, hey, we've got a COVID response strategy for you. Anyway, <laughs> um, final question before we, 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 we wrap up and say thanks. So the final question really here is around um, I just need to read the question again to remind myself. So essentially the question here is that um, how do you, around framing a brand, a business's brand in terms of one or two products, which may not be fitting the market right now, but there's a lot of demand. How do you, what's the fine line between sort of staying true to your original vision and then maybe moving it slightly to be able to support people in the short term due to this current crisis? Yeah, so um, we often talk about the, the as you know, uh, the as you know moments for every uh, organisation and, and brand when they're uh, communicating about their products and, and solution. Um, and I'll just make this up on the spot. I might just use a supermarket for an example in, in the current environment. But um, to say, you know, as you know, we at 
insert supermarket are here to help the community through this period um, because we want to be here for everyday Australians. That is why we have decided to dot, dot, dot. Um, I think that's maybe a way to think about this is if there are particular products or solutions that you believe are critical or, or pertinent for the current environment, still start from your purpose, still start from your, what you stand for as a company. So as you know, we are a company that is focused on dot, 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 um, and then go in and communicate those particular products or solutions that are fit for today's environment. It doesn't mean that it allows you to then ladder from your organisational purpose right into something more specific and tangible in the current setting uh, without it looking like you're being opportunistic. Um, it just allows that thread of messaging, and I'm talking very specific in, in communications here, but it allows that thread of messaging to allow you to communicate that in the right way without being seen to be opportunistic or, or exploitive. Uh, so hopefully that, that might answer the question from, from my side. But again, back to you, David. No, I think that's... I think that's covered it really well. So I'd, at that point, I think I just wanted to say thank you so much for one, your, your thoughts to help us as a community think about how we respond to COVID-19 and um, giving us the time of day and providing us this stuff. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. And um, to everyone who's joined us, thank you very much for coming and we'll see you at another EduBreak event in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. See you later all.